Watersheds. We're really excited to be here with you and we're excited to go and explore our local ecosystems and local food webs. My name is Emily and I have Dawn and Karen here with us today and we get to explore a really unique spot here in Los Osos. Dawn, can you tell us where we are today? Yeah, this is a piece of property that belongs to California State Parks, but it's not generally open hiking trail and it's not open for field trips. They said we could take a hike out here today and so we're going to take advantage of that and take you all along with us on a virtual field trip into this really interesting little parcel. It's a great place to, to cement some of the lessons that we've been learning this year. Awesome, we're so excited. So before we get going, we wanna make sure we have everything we need. So you're gonna be looking for your field journal. You should have received one from your teacher and make sure you've got it filled out before we get started. Karen, can you remind us what a watershed is? Well, right now we're standing in the Los Osos Creek watershed. And that's this area of land where any rain that falls in the mountains or the hillsides or even down in the lowlands drains into Los Osos Creek. Uh -huh. And then it drains out into Moore Bay and then to the ocean. Here on the central coast, all of our watersheds drain to the ocean, except for one, which is way off on the east side of the county, the Carrizo Plain area, which drains to a big salt lake. Otherwise, these are all coastal watersheds. They all drain to the Pacific Ocean here. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Remember to write down your notes in your Station 1 introduction section, and we're going to go ahead and head out to our next stop. here in springtime there's so many blooms hey Emily you know what this plant is Ooh, this looks really familiar to me does it smell good oh yeah Let's find out. I'm gonna say I think this is lavender this is a bush lupin Ooh, yeah that's right it's a this particular kind of lupin is specific to our our area right here this is a dune lupin or bush lupins they go but it's it's uh, native to this really fine soil that we've got here in Los Osos it's old sand dune soil and these guys love sandy sandy soil and I've already seen a bunch of bumblebees it's it's fun for me to be out here when it's blooming because you see all the native pollinators this is a habitat and so let's start our station number two right here because the the conversation I want to have with everybody is about how one habitat starts to transition to another and so right now we're going to transition from what's obviously grassland and some shrubs there's some other kind of low growing plants come on i want to see uh see the shift into the oak woodland hey don i've got a question for you yeah can you remind us what the difference between a habitat and an ecosystem is sure if you think of a neighborhood uh-huh somebody's house where they live inside that house has everything they need food shelter warmth that's their habitat they got okay. they got a yard and they got a place where they can just be it's kind of my home if you take a bunch of homes and different kinds of people living different kinds of lives in a, in a single neighborhood that's that's an analogy or that's a similar kind of uh, picture of, a, of an ecosystem okay so you can have neighborhoods next to other neighborhoods and one neighborhood is not exactly like another one is it no so that's the truth with ecosystems as well. So today, we're gonna to look at habitats like this one. This is home to pollinators. And the whole ecosystem here is all of the different kinds of plants that live together in one plant community type. And then we're gonna shift into another plant community type. And we're gonna do that again and again today. So we're gonna look awesome. at a bunch of different ecosystems. All right, okay? let's go. And it's 
check it out. We're just a few steps in from that bush lupin, and here we are, and it's a completely different zone. So you can imagine it's it's home to a whole bunch of different kinds of animals and plants here than it was out there. What do you think is the biggest change, Emily? What do you notice? Oh man, well, it's a lot shadier now. I think we've got a lot of big trees around us. Yeah, you got it. Oak woodland is where the oaks grow up and then form what they call a canopy, which is a cover, like an umbrella. And so the, the canopy of leaves, the oaks are basically hogging all the sunlight right here. Mm -hmm. And so what grows underneath the oaks are plants that actually thrive in shadier conditions. So it's a whole different kinds of grass. We've got different kinds of shrubs growing around us, but the beauty of the oaks is really unmistakable. What do you think about, about uh, oaks as a food source for people, Karen? Well, oaks? have provided acorns for people for many centuries in this area, um, but they provide a lot of animals with food source. And the cool thing about oaks is that they are sort of the keystone species of this type of habitat here. And the acorns can feed birds, it can feed insects. And so it's a really important um, way that this habitat gets formed is because of what the oak drops down, its acorns, its leaves, and, and uh, that creates nutrients in the soil and feeds the whole system. Don't forget fungus. Fungus and among us. Fungus, fungus among us. So I think that's it for, for station two, right, Emily? Are we ready to go I to station three? I think this is station three. So we're actually going to head over to station four now. Wow, we're, we're making tracks. I know. All right. I should, be, I should be doing a better job in my journal. Yeah. <laughs> you should be writing down your observations as we go. <laughs> Will do. Let's head over to station four. just came out of the shade. Where are we? Hey, this is a great example of what we call an ecotone. And an ecotone is a pl the place where two different kinds of habitat come together. You can see right here, we have grassland and some scrubland. And over here, we have the oak woodland. And what makes it special for wildlife is that the animals, for example, can use the resources in both habitats. And they can dart in and out Take the cover, for example, from the oak woodland, which can protect, say, it can protect a rabbit from a predator. The rabbit can dart out, graze in the grassland, gather food, dart back into the cover if they have a hawk overhead, for example. So ecotone tend to be really rich areas from the standpoint of wildlife diversity. See lots of birds feeding in and out of this area, and it's just a really fun place to come and watch wildlife. What, what are we looking at right here? These trees down here are willow trees, most of them, not all of them. And that's what we call riparian habitat. Riparian habitat is the type of habitat you find close to streams. And it, these kinds of plants really like the moisture um, found around the stream. And it, it creates a really special type of environment we're going to talk about more, right? Yep. Well, it makes sense that now that you just kind of said that. All of this ground is sloping downhill. So That's right. A drop of water that fell and then rolled down would end up in the creek down there, which is where and all the. What does that mean? Where are we in this watershed? We're getting pretty down close to the base of the We're watershed. We're getting down to the bottom of the watershed. Let's go check here. it out. This is a super cool plant called Equisetum or horsetails. This Feels is kind of rough. Yeah, they <laughs> actually have silica in them, which is part of what makes glass. And the Native Americans used to use this. It's almost like sandpaper, but it has lots of other uses. And there's, you know, there's a lot of plants around here that Native Americans used for food sources. There's coffee berry. Willows actually are like aspirin. They have a chemical in them that's like aspirin. So there's lots of plants here that have many uses. But the cool thing about horsetails is this is one of the most ancient plants around. This plant goes back in the fossil record millions of years. So it's really cool to see it here. And it's a, it's a water lover. Remember I mentioned the riparian vegetation. 
are all plants that like water. So when you start seeing horsetails, you know you're getting closer to some, some water. talking about coffee berry here's a beautiful example say yeah. some things about that guy see it's got beautiful glossy leaves and you can see it's it's starting to bloom and that's going to make some beautiful dark little berries later this season but i wanted to point out because it's right next to another plant that you also want to know and that is poison oak and let's get a close-up of that and the, the important thing to know is that the leaves come in threes you see how there's three and it's usually glossy like this, but it can really change its form. Sometimes it looks like a vine. Sometimes it looks like a shrub, like it does here. And you really need to pay attention. Sometimes the leaves are really large, and if it gets a lot of sunlight, the leaves will be tiny. So you have to really pay attention to make sure you watch out for it, because boy, can you get a terrible rash from this plant if you get the oil on you. lichen. It's called old man's beard. It looks just like it, doesn't it? <laughs> and you might wonder what's a lichen. <laughs> well, a lichen is kind of a combination plant. It's uh, made up of a fungus which creates the structure and an algae inside the fungus that gets protection from the fungus and lives inside there. Do you know what that's called? Symbiosis. <laughs> Did you know there's 54 different kinds of lichen right in this area? Wow. And so they, they all take different shapes and some of them are flat and they grow right along the branch and some of them are long and drapey like this. What's important to, to, um, to understand when you talk about symbiosis, it's all about making food mm -hmm. and how, how this, this organism lives. And so the food that the fungus needs to live comes from photosynthesis. Which is what? Uh -huh. Which is making food from sunlight, and that's what the algae does. That's right. The algae inside the lichen makes food from sunlight, and the fungus benefits from that. And so they live together in this organism called a lichen. And the word photosynthesis is, sounds like a hard word, but if you take it apart, it's actually not so hard, because the photo means the sun, and synthesis means to make. Make food from make sun. Make food from sun. Yeah. How do fungus make food when they don't have a partnership with algae. They feed off of the old dead wood and break it apart and release its nutrients back to the soil. If we don't have a healthy fungus in the soil breaking down all the plant material that's falling from the, the shrubs and trees, that's not living soil. A thriving healthy ecosystem depends on healthy living soil. Which we certainly have here. Yes, we do. Yeah. It's my old man beard. <laughs> so it seems like we're kind of walking along an ecotone. If you look out to your left, it's pretty barren and flat. And then on our right, our riparian habitat. Lots of shade, lots of lichen. Pretty cool. remember iNaturalist? So you might have done a lesson either this year or last year learning about how to use iNaturalist. It's an app and a web base that you take photos of plants and animals and you can identify different species that are in your area. And once that's in the database, that can be used for anyone to collect that data and learn more about the plants and animals in a certain area. So we want to try and figure out what this plant is here. So I'm going to go ahead and open my iNaturalist app and take a photo 
see. Let's see if I can just get some of the, the branch and the leaves to use this photo. And then it has suggestions for me. Let's see. come out of the riparian area and we're in this scrubland. This is uh, called coastal dune scrub is the name of this type of habitat. And uh, it, it likes to live close to the ocean. And it's got a lot of, this is Artemisia and there's coyote bush and all kinds of sort of scrub height plants. Um, this habitat has vanished in a lot of places because it also makes a really great place for people to live. So there's not a lot of this type of habitat left. It's called sand food. That's called sand food? Yeah, um, it's a really unusual plant. What a cool find Boy, that is. Isn't that strange looking? Okay. You can see all the little flowers in a little mound. I really don't know how that thing makes its living. Do you know, Karen? So what's really interesting about it is it's actually a parasite, which means it feeds off of the, the roots and the underground parts of the plant that it's next to. Interesting. We're seeing some white specks all around in the on the ground. So I want to talk to you guys about this particular soil type. This is an example of the Baywood fine soils type, which is really special. It's just to this area. Baywood Park is just down the way, and underneath where it's, people have been walking, it's disturbed. You can see it's it's sand, but look what's mixed up in the sand. Lots and lots of shells, all right? And so if you look around, it's just thick with shells. And, and up here in this particular sand dune, these shells go for a long, long way. What do you think that tells us? Who, who brought these shells here, do you think, Emily? These are a great source of food. So I think yeah. it might have been the Chumash. Yeah, this is, a, this is an ancient village site of the, of the northern Chumash people. And the indication is that they've been here, they were here for several thousand years, 10 or 11,000 years before the Europeans made contact. Wow. So this is the leftover of food preparation. The word for a pile of shells like this is a midden. A midden means a pile of castings, cast offs. This so this is, is, this is a kitchen midden. That's right. This is where the food was prepared and the ocean's not so far away. So it's a short distance to come over here and bring your shells. And Combine it with your acorn meal or whatever else is going to make your dinner. I wonder if looking at the shells, if we can tell what type of animal it was. I was just thinking that same thing, Emily. And I'm going to pick up a few different kinds of shells. And we're just going to see. You want that one? There's I know, a I know you're going for it. I've got one good one here. Okay, good. What do you got? I have a clam shell. kind of scraggly looking. That's an oyster. Yeah. I got another cockle. There's lots of different kinds of shells in here. I've seen abalone in here and pismo clam. Lots of different that kinds of shells. That also means they're eating little tiny bits of food from these shells. You can see it, even today in certain cultures of the world, they'd get a little, like a sharp toothpick or something like that and just pick out the little snail that lives inside these shells. But this, you know what it tells me? Imagine how much work it took to walk from where we are now all the way to the seashore to collect enough shells to feed the village and bring yeah. it back up here and then cook it. And these shells go for acres and acres and acres from where we're standing. And this is a great place to look at all of the habitat that these oak trees create. One, one thing you can see in old oak trees are cavities, holes. You can see up here. Yeah. There's holes develop where old branches break off. Woodpeckers drill holes. And um, 
that creates incredible nesting habitat for birds. There's um, insects, they'll grow in or under the bark here. So there's a lot of food source for other animals. And I don't know if you can see it way up there on the tree. You can see the holes? Oh yeah. Drilled in the tree. That's from oh, the yeah. acorn woodpecker. Sometimes you'll see a little stuff full of acorns. Hey, look what I found. That's the feather of a barn owl. What I love about barn owl feathers is they're so soft because barn owls fly silently at night. You, when they fly, you can't hear them. Well, there it is, a barn owl feather. <laughs> California cherry. Can you eat the cherry? You can, but they're not very good to Western people like, uh, you know, people who have a taste for cherries from Ralph's, like I do. <laughs> <laughs> they don't taste like the, the cherries that we, we grow in the, the orchards of the Central Valley. Mm. Uh, but they are edible and they're an important part of food source for Native Americans. But this guy is fully adapted to these poor uh, old sand dune soils. And let's go back to talking about watershed, yeah. habitats, and ecosystems. This is a great place for that. Look at how you can see the top edge of the bowl up there. There you go. Wow. So that's our beautiful Hollister Peak and the mountains around it. And rain that falls up in those hills, obviously, is going to come down, right? Down the slopes. And the water can carry not just itself down the slope, but it'll also bring soil particles. So. What you find is you have thinner soils up high and that creates a certain type of habitat up there. So you might find um, ecosystems based around chaparral landscapes, which is a scrubby type of brushland. It's the kind that burns really easily actually. And then as you come farther down, you start to see grasslands. Grasslands like a little deeper, richer soil and a little bit less steep slope. And then even farther down, we get more into our scrublands we've been looking at here, and finally down into the oak woodlands and riparian systems of the, the bottomlands. But you could also find oaks on the north sides of these hills. Don, why do you think they're on the north side? The soil on the north slope, even of a sand dune, much less of a hill or a mountain, has got more shade. And so it's always going to be a little cooler and a little more moist. You know what I love about this is that you know, here's the watershed going down towards the bottom of the watershed, which is the creek. And as you look, the, the height of the plants get taller and taller and taller. And so if you look at, starting up here with these, these scrubby oaks, transition into those bigger coast live oaks, and then down below you've got these big cottonwoods and willows that are, that are keeping up with the height even as the soil falls away, which means they're getting taller, which means they got more water. So it just makes sense. If you look up at the draws where the water flows up in the hills, you can see more oaks following the water courses. And the other thing I want to say about grassland versus shrubland is a lot of this grassland that we can see up here is not because of that's just nature taking its course. That's because of human activity, mainly cattle grazing on these hills. So these are all grazed hills. Uh, and so that's why you have patchwork of grass and shrub. And of course, Karen's absolutely right that the soil change, soil type changes as well. But it's always a mix and it's always good to be thinking about why is this habitat different from that habitat? Why does it look like this? And one, one thing that's pretty amazing about our landscapes is how much humans over the centuries have changed the landscape. Um, like Don said, a lot of that grassland might have been scrubland, 
And the other thing that has happened in our landscape is we've brought in seeds from other locations and mm -hmm. many of the grasses you see, all these grasses around us right now, and many of the grasses up on those hillsides are not, did not originate here. They originated from Europe or other places. Well, you're, you're setting the stage for our next stop. So let's cool. walk. Let's get on. Let's walk up and have a talk about that. Don had mentioned how being on the north side of this hill slope here that it's it's cooler and shadier it's not in direct sunlight so that soil is going to be more moist and be a richer soil and a healthier soil so if you can imagine the soil that's going to be all the way over there on the other side of the creek facing the south side with the sunlight all of that's going to be much drier soil so we have two soil column samples do you guys remember what a soil column is so we're going to look at the difference between the two soils from here and all the way over there. So make sure you check them out and see what you observe. underneath these towering California live oaks, same kind of tree, and they formed a big canopy over our heads. Here, it's just a little bit taller than I can reach, and it's the same tree, and it's obviously pretty old. And the reason it's this small, or like an elf, is because the soil is so poor here. And this is elfin forest. This is elfinized oak tree. <laughs> I think that these are eucalyptus trees, but do we know if they're a native species? Well, the, the eucalyptus have become what we call naturalized, right? They are they are part of the landscape and they feel like they're, they're, they belong here naturally, but they are having an effect on the ecosystem that it's important to look at. So if you look underneath, there's fewer plants. And then as you get further away from them, there's more and more native plants. And so it's very obvious once you look at it through that, that lens of diversity of plant life around the eucalyptus trees that they have a, a way of tamping down other plants from growing. Do you why? I do, but you, I would rather oh. have you tell me. <laughs> they have an oil in their leaves, right? That's why they smell so good and strong, you know. And the oil actually inhibits a lot of our native plants from growing in their I call it chemical warfare. Chemical warfare, that's good. <laughs> and they're winning. Yep, and you can even see a, some farm operations going on, on in the distance there where the farmers are taking advantage of the rich soil down at the bottom. So, Don, we call this station the recovery station. Why are we calling it the recovery station? Well, you know, it's good to see a farmer on a tractor out there because that's what used to happen right here. This, these were pea fields not too long ago, and when the state parks bought this land, they decided to let it return to a, a more natural state. Uh, so what we're seeing here is this really a picture of time because we're we're standing on soil where there's a lot of evidence of thousands of years of human habitation through the shell content of the Shumash kitchen middens. But then we know that there were there were pea you know fields here not too long ago. Well now it doesn't look like a pea field at all. So we're starting to see some of the shrublands coming back. And this is a, a picture to me of recovery. Recovery is different from restoration. Restoration is where you make an, an intentional effort and people get involved to actually accelerate that recovery of nature from a disturbance. But up here, this is nature sort of coming back. So our next stop is gonna be the restoration. Yeah, we'll go see how the restoration is taking place. Awesome.
talk about maybe what you're seeing out here is what sort of food web or animals we might find in this area and what might eat what as a food source. So as we've been walking, I've seen some insects, some good pollinators and beetles, also some reptiles, some lizards. Uh, there's probably some snakes that we would find around here. But probably rabbits. Probably rabbits. I know I've seen quail too. What do quail eat? Do you know? They eat seeds. Okay. But some plants. All right. Uh, so I might just jot down some of the different animals that I've been seeing as I've been walking around to make some observations. Yeah, don't forget to use your field book. Scientists like to use field books to take their notes because it's really hard to remember everything you've seen. Yeah. There's so much out here to see. And you sh if you make a habit of it, you can refer back to it and remember what was the name of that plant or where did I see that bird? So it's a good habit to get into in your science exploration to keep your field books. At the top of the hill, we were talking about recovery of the, of the ecosystem from, from agricultural disturbance. And over time, the land has started to recover and the plants are coming back. But that's different from restoration where people get involved to speed things up a little bit. So down here, the state parks and some volunteers and some, some folks from the middle school have been restoring this habitat for quite some time. We've put in a bunch of native California shrubs. So it's kind of interesting to see what's happening here is less of that, that belt grass that we've been seeing all day. Uh -huh. It's not from around here, it's from Africa more shrubs and where we're headed right now it's going to be pretty thick dense shrub cover and almost no invasive non-native grasses let's go take a look so if you look ahead at the trail here you can see there's almost no grasses now small shrubs and some flowers but look how tall those shrubs are they're way overhead and that's because these were all restored intentionally so this is a this is more native habitat coming back post agricultural disturbance because of human restoration wow look at this weird stuff it's like a foam on this bush from far away it looked like a flower do you know what it is? Oh. This is made by the spittle bug, the larvae of a spittle bug. And if you dig around in this foam, you can probably find a little worm in there. These plant, um, insects suck the juices out of the plant and then they create these little foamy cocoons that gives them a nice moist environment to live in. There's also some pretty cool beetles in here. Ooh. and showing us some really cool local ecosystems. We're really excited about having a wonderful day to go explore nature. Don't forget that you can go home and find another place to hike around your neighborhood and take this along. Remember, a field journal allows you to go and observe what's around you and have fun with it. Thanks so much, and we look forward to next time.